they get into the, the question of like, what does this experience want to be? Is this an experience about pouring over tables and charts? Is it an experience about telling a story? Like, what do we want this to be? And obviously, um, digital, just like anything else, has the opportunity to make these experiences stronger or potentially um, to, to, to degrade them. And of course, it's going to be different for different people. Um, and so I think one of the lenses in the art of game design is about the lens of imagination, because you have to be careful not to step on the player's imagination and take too much away. When you provide too much illustration, too much animation, um, it, it takes it away. Hi, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. I'm Gary Snow. Joining me today is Jesse Shell, the author of the critically acclaimed and foundational Art of Game Design, which provides contextual framework for uh, game design through 113 lenses. And Jesse also founded Shell Games in 2002, and he is the CEO that has created successful titles like Among Us and I Expect You to Die, while also innovating in the VR environments. Jesse is also a professor at Carnegie Mellon University and a frequent guest speaker at GDC, where he shares valuable lessons learned over his 30 plus year career. Jesse, it's a pleasure to have you join me today. Welcome. Hey, great to be here. You uh, have a bit of a following, probably even a cult following, I would say, that uh, people mm -hmm. really enjoy your talks at GDC and uh, the experience that you bring to the table. But before we get into some of those lessons, tell us a little bit about how you got into game design in the first place. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, games have been something I've been into my whole life. Um, ever since I was very young. And when I, when I look back at all the things I've been interested in, for me, it, it comes back to things that seem magical or the, is the common thread uh, through all the interests I've pursued over the years. And for me, that's been everything from actual stage magic um, to, you know, I was, I was a professional juggler for a period of time um to computer science because there's a real magic in that to regular science to parapsychology and games are certainly something that seems uh especially magical because you take something that is just so mundane right little bits of cardboard or computer circuit and then suddenly people are invested in this experience that they're having strong emotions about and there's something really magical in that. So games were something I got very involved with when I was young, you know, in the realm of card and board games. And when digital things showed up, I started getting, um, I started exploring that because I've always been most interested in what are the kinds of game experiences that are, are new? What, what are the game experiences no one's ever tried before? So this ended up leading me on a path I ended up, uh, after I kind of did my circus work and then uh, studying computer science in, in undergraduate, I found my way to uh, Disney Imagineering because I in graduate school, I'd done some virtual reality work. And in the 90s, Disney opened a virtual reality studio and I started working there. And so I was at Disney Imagineering where I became the creative director of the VR studio. I uh, was there for about seven years working on a thing called Disney Quest, which was Disney's virtual reality theme park and a game called Toontown Online that some people may know. And uh, one of the big inspirations for that, of course, was Greg Kostikian's Toon uh, tabletop uh, RPG. Um, then I came uh, to back to Carnegie Mellon about 20 years ago, where I started teaching at the Entertainment Technology Center and also opened my own studio, Shell Games. And Shell Games now, we have about 150 people. And in 20 years, we've shipped about 100 games <laughs> over that time. And in 2008, you wrote the first edition of the Art of Game Design. And I'll yeah. put links to all that. Uh, what was the what was the inspiration to finally put pen to paper and, and share your stories? Yeah. So I, you know, for me, thinking about entertainment and thinking about game design, it's something that I've always has always been interesting to me. Um, uh, it, it, because again, it, it is just so magical and understanding the way the human mind works when it engages with entertainment, when it engages with games is something that I've just always found fascinating. And when I um, 
I started teaching game design classes at Carnegie Mellon, at, you know, after my time at Disney. And I was approached by a publisher who, who uh, wanted me to do a very technical book. And I was not interested in doing a, a technical book. It was about the Panda 3D engine. And I'm like, no, I don't I'm not really want to do that. But I have had this idea for a book all about the psychology of entertainment. And they said, yeah, no one wants that book. Um, but you seem to be teaching about game design. Could you have maybe a book about that? There could be interest. And I thought, well, it's okay. I'm all the psychology of entertainment stuff. That's all, that's all game design is. Sure, I'll just take that, all this stuff I've been working on and channel it into um, game design. And when I talked to experienced game designers at the time and told them, I'm thinking of writing this book about video game design, you know, um, because at the time there were very few books on that topic. The old timers all told me, no, you can't write good books about game design. It's not possible. And I said, what, what do you mean it's not possible? And they said, well, the problem is games are all so different from each other. If you give somebody advice about you should do this, it'll be right for one game, but wrong for another. So no matter what you do, any advice you give, it's going to be wrong. So you really can't write a good book about game design. And I thought about that very seriously because I saw the wisdom of that. And I understood that there, there was a certain truth in, in it. Because games can be too complex, too simple, you know, the right game, the wrong audience. There's all kinds of ways that you can, you can, that could be true. And as I thought about that, I made this realization that questions can't be wrong. Um, that question might not, might be irrelevant, but a question can never be wrong. And I realized if I centered the book, if I made it a list of questions, these are the questions you should ask yourself when you're working on your game then it could be helpful to everyone. And that's what the idea of the, the, the book of lenses is. It's really just many different questions you should ask yourself um, about your game when you're working on it. Yeah, I, when I reviewed it again, you know, I bought this book probably about three or four years ago when I reviewed it again in preparation for the interview, I went, boy, it's almost like a checklist. If you had your rocket on the launch pad and you were like going like, hey, do we have, you know, ignition and all that kind of stuff. Your 113 lenses is almost like a checklist of, and even beyond that 113, there's probably three or four questions within each lens that you could ask yourself and go, does it meet some of the criteria? And depending upon your, your goal for the game, uh, it might matter and it might not, but uh, you based uh, some of it off the uh, book, A Pattern Language, written by Christopher Alexander in 1977. Um, yeah. when, when did you discover that book and how did that play into your uh, design in general? Oh, yeah. Pattern Language was a tremendously inspirational book for me. Um, I had found it when I was at Disney. I, when I worked at Disney Imagineering, they had an amazing library called the IRC. And I made it my habit every Monday morning, I would go to the IRC and pick out a book and, uh, and read that book for the week. And so I would get a different book every week. And I would always just roam the shelves looking for whatever caught my eye. And at some point, the Christopher Alexander books were there and they definitely caught my eye. And um, I was absolutely fascinated. Like the first one, Timeless Way of Building, uh, just kind of just blew my mind because it was so much about the nature of experience design and the psychology of how people interact with the world. And then pattern language is incredible because it's this, it's this long list of these are the patterns that, that, that define the way people interact with their, their space and place. And some of that is are huge patterns like um, the relationship between cities and, and the terrain. And then others are tiny, tiny patterns like you know the, the, the way the doors are placed in a house. The, the, it's, it was sort of incredible the amount of wise things that he had to say about, about all these patterns. And um, at the time I was struggling with the Toontown online game design, trying to make this massively multiplayer world that was incredibly accessible. And I, I, was, I had real trouble trying to figure out how am I going to make this work? And then after reading pattern language, it's like, oh, okay, I get it now. I see the patterns that apply and uh, make this work. So it was, it was 
It was meaningful to me in terms of understanding how humans relate to space, because that's obviously very important for game design, especially video game design. But then it was also important for me as a way of analyzing um, design. And so I, I would say that the two books that influenced art game design the most were Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud and Pattern Language um, you know, by Christopher Alexander, without a doubt. I uh, was sad to see that he actually passed away in March of this year. Did you ever get a chance to meet him? No, I never did. I, you know, I knew, I knew he, you know, he was, he was certainly getting older and wasn't especially well. And I, I kept thinking, but you know, should I, should I find a way to reach out? And I realized, you know, that would, that would be more about me that I, I, I think that would be more for me than it would be for him. So I decided, no, I, I think, I think, I think I will, I will let that alone, but his, his works, I, I, I am a fervent believer that when the world looks back in 500 years, um, they're going to recognize Christopher Alexander as one of the greatest geniuses of our time. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I really, I really do think that he, people are going to look at him up there with Einstein in terms of uh, how he changed the world, which sounds crazy because right now, pe most people aren't aware of his work, don't understand, uh, have, haven't seen it. And and don't appreciate it, but that's often how it is. There's a, a lot. Of, there's a lot of great work that is not appreciated until long after uh, the person has passed. So, I think I honestly think Christopher Alexander's day is still coming. And so, when he uh, you know put together basically these like foundational truths of the patterns of living in architecture and how we exist as humans, and then you applied your um, own game design principles over top of those lenses or, and built them into it. Did you, um, did you struggle with coming up with 113 or was it kind of just like an easy flow of like, yeah, this just makes sense to me, just like the pattern? Yeah, it wasn't like I set some goal. My goal honestly was to have as few as, as I reasonably could. When I started out, I assumed there would be um, maybe between 60 and 80. And in the first edition, there were a hundred exactly. And then with the subsequent editions, other ones um, ended up getting uh, needed, needing to be added. Um, and uh, so it, it was, it, it was just something that happened very much a bit at a time. Um, the, the hard part for the book was to figure out what order to present everything in because game design is such an interconnected situation you know the the characters affect the gameplay and the gameplay affects the story and the story affects the characters and the rules affect everything and uh, so figuring out what order to talk about it was that was definitely one of the most challenging parts of it and that's why there's this sort of this map structure in the book i i honestly took inspiration from the uh the building of the international space station because they had to build it while they were living in it which raises these interesting questions, like what room do you build first? And the answer is you build the room that you need to use the most times in a day. And so they built the bathroom first <laughs> because you need to use that more times than you need any other room. And then after that, they started um, you know, building places to eat and, and, then, and then places to sleep and, and then other, other things. But realizing that, um, Figuring out the center and then building outward was the right way to uh, to to structure the book ends up being very helpful. And you kind of hinted at it the the complexity of game design because there's so many different moving parts and elements to it. When you um, think about your career into game design and what attracted you to it in the first place, is it just uh, like solving the puzzle? And because it's so complex, it's always interesting and solving problems and figuring out what to do next and trying to fit it all together. Well, game design is game design is a magical thing because you're you're creating something, but you're also letting the person who experiences it, you're letting them be a part of it and own it. Um, I mean, writing a book is fun and making a movie is fun, but games are different in that regard because you're you're it's more like you're you're building a house 
and a house is just a house, but people are going to move into the house and make it their home. And that's more what game design is like. You're, you're, you're leaving space for people to come in and be a part of it. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's, it's a very special feeling, right? People, people always talk about, <laughs> it's easy to get biblical about, right? Because, you know, the, you talk about the God making humans in God's image, and what is God but a creator? And of course, as humans, we want to be creators and create things that, we, that, that people uh, are part of. Um, it's it's just it's just in, incredibly special because you know games are really meaningful to people in in um, you know when, when when someone finds a really great game that they really resonate with they'll play it the rest of their lives. You look at the relationship people have with with golf or with poker or you know any number of games that they they just this is now woven into my my social life you know that's scrabble for some people a lot, a lot of these classic games they, they they they're just incredibly meaningful because they they invite you in they give you a place to to be yourself and a way to connect with other people that you can't connect easily with in the real world um so there's there's just incredible magic there and so to to be able to be a part of that and make um and every every game designer thinks the same thing how can i make a better game how can i make a better game than what was already there and that that aspiration is i think what always keeps us going how much of it is a little bit of like that magic and a little bit of luck versus uh you know sitting down with a schematic and going this is going to be oh, the best game ever oh oh my god luck is such a gigantic part of it and it's important to realize that because when when luck is a part of the equation the answer is like think about lottery tickets you know they you you could plan all day to buy the perfect lottery ticket but the answer is if you want to win the lottery you gotta buy a lot of tickets <laughs> and so it's the same thing with games you can plot and plot and plot and try and make the perfect the perfect the perfect game but really it's much better to make, okay, make a game and make it be the best you can. And now move on and make another game and another game. If you, if you really want to find something that touches people, connects with people, uh, cause that it works in two ways. It's partly each, each swing you take is one more shot of maybe finding something that really connects. And then of course, the more times you do that, the more you learn and the better you get. Um, I often think about angry birds, which was such a worldwide sensation and i believe it was uh rovio's 43rd game and i don't know anybody who could name any of the first 42 um but but yeah when 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 luck is part of it then you you want to make as many as you can and over your career i mean you've made a lot of games and you started your own game design company and how do you maintain that kind of cutting edge um attitude towards the games like with, with all the emerging technology that's coming out there does it help to be teaching in the environment where you're forced to kind of know the latest oh, oh yeah i mean teaching teaching helps in a number of ways um it, you know over at the entertainment technology center we we have the luxury like one of the attitudes there is if we if we use current technology to and and have the students focus on current technology which nowadays would be you know mobile pc playstation 5 those sorts of things if we focus on that we're really preparing students for the past because by the time they get out of school that is all in the past so we try hard to focus on well what's coming next what are the trends that are likely to be coming and so we, we have a lot of focus on that cutting edge side of it and of course we can try things there that you wouldn't, uh, you would never try in the in the marketplace, and uh, so that's incredibly helpful because when I'm trying to make things happen in the world, um, I can look back at these futuristic projects that students have tried to create and say, okay, you know, hey, there's this new technology that's coming to market. Well, I watched students try and make something like that six years ago, and here's what I learned from it. That that's incredibly 
um, helpful. And, and also more than just technology, it, it ends up being a place where you can experiment with types of gameplay that people wouldn't normally think of and consider because maybe there's no market for it. Um, but just because there's no market for it doesn't mean that there isn't somebody who would want it. Because often when we say there's no market, what we really mean is, well, the market is too small for that. But it may be a very small but very passionate uh, market. And when you, when you can find a way to reach people who and deliver them something that no one's ever bothered to deliver to them before, they appreciate it so much and it can be so meaningful to them. And I believe you gave a talk that was, uh, I'm not too sure if it was at GDC, but it was thinking outside the box. And it talked a little bit about trying to find that next piece and try to figure out where the trends are going. And I guess the question I, I have for you, when when people like in VR, for example, I mean, it's been tried mm -hmm. kind of periodically and it's kind of had blips and ups and downs. And I know you're really into the space right now and with Meta yeah. increasing into VR more and more. Is this finally the time that that's gonna happen? Um, or do people oh. like, lots of people say it's gonna be like 3D TV. It's kind of, it comes and goes and comes and goes. Oh, no, yeah, right. And I can understand why people would feel that way, but that is absolutely not. This is not a 3D TV situation. I mean, the reason 3D TV fell was because people didn't, the people making it didn't comprehend the way human beings feel about stereoscopy. You know, stereo images are not something new. We've had them since the 1800s. Um, you look at those old, you know, stereogram viewers and, or the, you know, Viewmaster, those sorts of things. Um, 3D imagery is cool, but it's problematic because of the way it has edges, particularly with animated imagery. Um, I often think about the fact Alfred Hitchcock made a 3D movie. He made Dial M for Murder. Most people don't realize that movie was actually in 3D. And when he saw it in 3D, he was so embarrassed about how it didn't really work the way he thought it would work. And it didn't engage the audience the way he wanted. He wouldn't allow the premiere to be shown in 3D. So I often feel like, yeah, if Alfred Hitchcock couldn't do it, what makes you think that you're going to be able to get uh, 3D TV, right? But, but VR is not about 3D. Um, 3D is part of it, sure, but that's not the point of it. The point of it isn't like that there are three dimensional images. The point of VR is it's able to create this illusion of presence where you actually feel like you're in a place that you're not. And that's incredibly special. This is a thing that flat media, you know you know, PC games and TV shows, like the movies, they, they can't do this. They, no one ever watches a TV show or plays a video game and thinks, oh my God, is this really happening in the room with me right now? No one ever thinks that. But we see all the time in VR, someone's working on a hard puzzle maybe, like we're playing I Expect You to Die, you know, it was, it was one of our successful VR games. And they're thinking about this hard puzzle and they're like, hmm, I'm not sure how I'm going to solve this. And you'll watch them do it. They'll reach over and lean on a virtual table that's not there. And they'll kind of fall for a second. They're like, oh, 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 wait. And of course they knew. Like if you ask them, is that table real? They know it's not real, but they forgot for a minute. Their body believed it was real. Their body was willing to accept it, even though their mind knew it wasn't. And sometimes we let our body um, do its own thing. Anyway, so... That's the power of VRs, this, this power of, of immersion and being in another place and being with other people. And um, uh, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a saying that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Most people don't realize at this point, more Meta Quest headsets have been sold than Xboxes uh, on the market for the current generation of Xbox right now. I mean, there were already at the, I don't know, the number somewhere around 15 million um, VR headsets. And when people say, oh, when's it gonna go mass market? I'm like, how many, what do you need? Well, how many, what numbers do you, do you need? What we've seen with VR is the number of headsets has been doubling for about the past four or five years. You know, it was a few years back, it was a million, the next year, two million, then it was four, then it was eight, and now we're around 15 or 16 this year. 
Um, and there's no reason, there's a lot of people predicting, yeah, it's probably going to be 30 plus next year. So I think it's here, that, that time is here. And this is incredibly relevant for the tabletop space because the key feature, if you, if you look at the, what Meta is talking about, the key feature that they're talking about for the, for the new Pro headset and even on the current Quest 2 headset and possibly on the Quest 3 um, is pass through augmented reality. And so we're gonna have these headsets that do both virtual reality and pass through augmented, video pass through augmented reality. And I, and I think that's gonna bring a lot of people in. And the same thing, we don't, we, Apple hasn't announced what they're going to do, but the rumors have all been that video pass through uh, seems to be part of their strategy. So, and, and uh, one of the easy, the applications is uh, tabletop role playing, and, and of course, we probably people may have seen that uh, the game uh, uh, Demio uh, already has the video pass through uh, version. Uh, so, but you made a game called Until You Fall, which was essentially uh, like a virtual sword fighting game, correct? Yeah, yeah. And and that kind of made, when I saw that, I, it made me kind of think of, you could actually have that first person, like, you know, you're crawling through the dungeon as in Dungeons and, Dungeons and Dragons and actually yeah. sword fighting, but you you implemented some kind of uh, um, motions that made the environment like hitting the swords a little bit more realistic. And was that like a yeah. key element in that? Oh yeah, so un until you fall, you know, I, like I've always loved, um, sword and sorcery gaming uh you know uh I, I you know i was i'm old enough to have been there when dungeons and dragons was new and and all of that and uh i've always felt like when people have tried to translate sword play gaming into game controllers it never really felt right because you're just tapping a couple buttons with your thumbs and um like that matches, like if you're shooting, like I understand that tapping buttons with your thumbs, it's a lot like shooting. That's what do you do with a gun? You tap a thing with your finger. Um, but sword play is such a physically, it, it's so much about the way you move your body. And one of the things we say when we design virtual reality experiences, because that's, that's, that's what virtual reality is. It's bringing your body into a simulation not just your mind, not just ideas, you're bringing your actual body into here. So we always ask ourselves, how does this experience use my body? And the part of the problem you have when you're gonna try and make a virtual reality sword fighting game is you, yes, I can track your motion, but I can't restrict your motion in any direct way. So when your sword hits somebody's shield, like what's to stop you from just, keeping your arm moving, right? And that's a real challenge and a, and a real problem. And so what, what we saw with early sword fighting games, we, 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 would, we would talk about the waggle factor, that the, the obvious strategy is, well, I'm just going to stick my sword into the guts of this enemy and wave it around really fast, which does not feel anything like sword fighting, right? Because sword fighting, swords are heavy and they need to block and they need to counter. Um, and so we developed a number of, of methods uh, of getting people to move in the right way. Because there's this whole effect where when, you, when we can get you to do certain things with your body, it controls how you feel. It's just like if you force yourself to smile, it actually changes your mood. And we don't like to think that that's true, but it's true. Like the things you do with your body change how you feel. So we realized that if we could get you to make big, broad, heroic movements and get you to kind of position yourself and take the stance of a hero and move like a hero, it would make you feel like a hero. And so we designed a game that really, it wants you to take big, broad strokes and it rewards you for doing that. And uh, similarly, we realized that, yeah, we can't, we can't stop you um, if you're if you're making a wrong movement. But if we incentivize you to stop, you actually have a full body tactile suit on at all times, and it's your musculature, your muscles. If I can get you, if I can incentivize you to move a sword in a way that you move your hand fast and then try and stop, 
that it's important to stop and it's important to stop, that feels like hitting something because your muscles have clunk, have like done that thing. And it actually feels like a tactile, um, uh, like a tactile motion. Um, so uh, until you falls design was very tricky. We, we wanted it to be a balance of, we didn't want it to just tell you, oh, you have to do exactly these motions and that's all you do. Instead, what we do is we, we give you kind of what we call, you know, a uh, sword fighter site where you can, you, you can kind of see like, oh, these are the places, if I hit here, it's going to have the most effect. Um, because you can just hit all you want. It just doesn't have much effect. But if you, if you hit in the spots where it's going to have the most effect, then you get these powerful moments. And, it, and we, we chose to make it two-handed sword fighting because again, it's about engaging your full body. And, and um, anyway, so that's a game that I, I just absolutely love. Like I, I, we are, I'm so proud of Until You Fall. I, I really think it captures the feeling of sword fighting better than anything that's ever been created. Yeah, and I've seen reviews to that effect where it just seems to be able to have that feel like if you were right there uh, compared to a lot of other attempts at that. and. And now taking it down to like the micro level of, uh, and you shared with me, you've got some uh, old box sets uh, with you from D&D &D, um, that uh, oh, you yeah. have handy. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I actually made sure I had these nearby when we were working on Until You Fall, because we realized, you know, thinking about, you know, I've got like the, you know, the, uh, the old white manuals here from the original Dungeons and Dragons, looking at how simple they are, and thinking about like what was important, because when we started working on Until You Fall, the hope was, wow, we're going to, this could end up being this whole world that grows and grows over time. And we, we may yet be growing it even more. We've grown it a bit, but we may even take it uh, farther and farther forward. And when I, when I was saying about going to the micro level, uh, as I, prior to the, the uh, interview started, we talked about uh, one D&D and Hasbro's announcements of the virtual tabletop and what their goal is, is to make mm -hmm. 3D environment for you to, to play with. And so I guess from my perspective, it's a little bit like playing virtual chess where you're, you're moving the pieces on the board, but virtually. And do you see that as just the next step in order to get to this virtual space? I, I think it's, it's fascinating. Like the, the realm of tabletop RPG and what constitutes the best experience is such a fascinating thing to explore. Cause you know, I've been, I've been watching that for a little over 40 years now. And um, there's always debates. You know, I remember in the old days, the debate of like, really dice? Why would you need dice in the game? This, the, you know, the, do you, that's, that's, that shouldn't be what this game is about. This is a game about imagination and storytelling and human interaction. Um, and then miniatures, really? Like, why wouldn't you just use your imagination? You don't need those miniatures. If you, if you must have a, if you, if you must have some kind of schematic, why not just make it as simple as possible, little cardboard Chips and then use your imagination. But, and then of course, this huge debate of, oh my God, we're gonna integrate cards into Dungeons and Dragons, what? what's happening? Um, so these are, these are all great questions because they get into the, the question of like, what does this experience want to be? Is this an experience about pouring over tables and charts? Is it an experience about telling a story? Like, what do we want this to be? And obviously, um, Digital, just like anything else, has the opportunity to make these experiences stronger or potentially um, to, to, to degrade them. And of course, it's going to be different for different people. Um, and so I think one of the lenses in the art of game design is about the lens of imagination, because you have to be careful not to step on the player's imagination and take too much away. When you provide too much illustration, too much animation, um, it, it takes it away. Like a thing that I've done for years in teaching my game design class is I would force the students to, you know, when they, we, we when we, it's time to talk about story, I would make them do create a tabletop adventure, uh, just using a very basic, very thin structure, 
um, I would make them create a, you know, a three hour one shot. And they, so the idea is put them in groups of four and they'd each, um, they'd each lead uh, the other three on a, on a three hour one shot and they'd go on three of these experiences. And we have more students who've had experience with tabletop role-playing games now, but boy, there was a long time when almost nobody did. Um, there was this kind of dark period where anybody who would have done that was just completely playing video games. And we're, we see more students now who've done tabletop, but I would say even still, maybe only a quarter of the class. And these are people serious, you know, taking a graduate level <laughs> class in game design. And only about a quarter of them have played a tabletop role playing game before. And it's fascinating because you watch them get in there to do the design and they can't believe the freedom that they have. They're like, wait, I can make this about anything and anything can happen at any time. They're used to video games where everything is like, no, you've, you're in this fixed world and these fixed things can happen and enemy, there can only be this many enemies and those, those sorts of things. And now we'll have the whole world rip in two and like six gods will come out of the ground. Like you can make anything happen at any time just because you feel like it. This freedom is, is new to them. And I think it's, it's a very important aspect. And that's the danger when you get these very mechanistic um, systems. It's, it's the danger when you, I mean, even when you do something as simple as I'm going to use miniatures. Okay, great. So that means we're all, the game is now going to consist of whatever the miniatures can, can do. And that's what this online stuff is. It's just, um, it's just a fancy version of miniatures uh, for the, for the most part. And so I, I think that's the balance to the, to the extent that this enhances my play which I think, I personally think getting the charts and tables out of the way and letting that be a little more in the background, that can actually really enhance play. It can allow for much more complex play because it's okay, the computer's handling, handling the charts and tables. So we can actually have a little more complexity and that can be a plus sometimes. Um, uh, and there can be ways that this makes it easier the other thing I think can be a real plus is I think in some ways the digital stuff can invite more people in because if there are people who struggle to imagine some of this or don't quite get it, the game can be kind of boring for them. And if this helps them understand it and get it more, you can now, they can possibly be more engaged, but it's uh, it's a, it's a question. It's a very, it's a very delicate balance. Um, and I, I think the thing that's really going to, to push it for people, I really do believe, is these the augmented reality headsets that are just around the corner for everybody. The fact that they are going to let you have, you're going to be able to be in your real room looking at your real table, but your virtual friends are going to be sitting across from you. And you're going to have a table where you're actually able to have animated situations playing out that you can reach in and control. I really do think this is going to become um, a, a, a tremendous force uh, in, in, the, in the realm of uh, tabletop role-playing. And, you know, I, I, not to say that it's going to replace the, the more traditional aspects of it, because there's such an intimacy of just all being in the same room. But for situations where you can't be in the same room, you know, you're like, well, we would have played on Zoom, but we could do this instead. Like that can be pretty great or, or hybrid situations. There are three of us in the same room, but there are three of us who are gonna be virtual. Like that, that can be very powerful as well. And then to be able to, the artful use of, of animated miniatures, I, I think has the potential to elevate the game as well, but you have to do it right. One of the things that is on the horizon, and I don't know how it's impacting you and your design, is AI. And like mm -hmm. in Dungeons and Dragons or tabletop role playing games, an AI GM in that kind of infinite uh, strategy where, like, who knows what could happen if the AI can come up with it. Um, have you seen that kind of start to creep into game design? It's funny. AI is one of these things that's that's been making making. Uh, it's been writing checks it can't cash for about 40 years. And everyone's given up on it. Everyone's like, yeah, 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 AI, whatever. You're, yeah, sure, AI storytelling. I don't believe you. But 
things are happening where suddenly it's starting to become possible. There's, there's a, um, so we've, we've got a team of students, for example, who are over at the school who are exploring uh, AI chatbots. And wait a minute, how should we really be using these in games? We People may have seen the game AI Dungeon, um, which is interesting because it's kind of this AI building a virtual world on the fly based on a bunch of AI stuff. I find AI Dungeon interesting because at first you feel like, oh, wow, this is amazing. This thing is just improvising and building a real world and all of that. But the more you play it, you're like, oh, wait, this isn't really a real world. This is more of a dream world because if I go through a door and then I walk back through the door, like, wait, the room, where'd the room go? It's different now. And I meet somebody and they say something and then I do something else. And if I go and find them again, like they don't remember what happened before because it's all just very... This AI is doing this weird stream of consciousness thing. So that's more of a, to my point of view, that's more of a parlor trick than anything else. And it doesn't hold up very well. Um, I do think we are going to soon be seeing these AI characters that interact a lot more like humans. I, I do think in the realm of video games, this has been the missing piece. There's a professor, Chris Swain, who made this interesting prediction, and I think he's right. He talks about how in the early days of film, people did not take film seriously. They didn't believe that it was a serious medium. Um, it was for children. It was for people who weren't very smart. It wasn't like writing. It wasn't like literature. It was this fluffy thing. And that all changed when we went from silent films to sound. As soon as sound got integrated into film, it took over. And video became the literature of the 20th century. It just took over as the dominant medium for how humans communicate. And, you know, we still see that now, you know, you look at, even you look at things like TikTok and the power of YouTube and Twitch, like it's all the power of, of video as a, as a medium. The parallel he draws is you draw the parallel to games, people don't look at games as a serious medium, as a serious art form. Sure, serious entertainment, serious, you know, bubble gum and popcorn, but like that, but not, not a real serious medium that like, that intelligent people um, engage with. And his argument was like, yeah, it's not, it's not that games can't talk because they can talk. We know that's not the problem. What games can't do is they can't, engage with you in an intelligent way. The, the verbs in video games right now are all below the neck verbs. It's, it's all things about your body, running and jumping and shooting and punching. It's all stuff you do below the neck. Things about, oh, I'm, I'm gonna persuade or I'm going to fool or I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to you know, out, out, outwit somebody. Games are not good at this. It's part of what's magic about tabletop role playing is we use so many of those above the neck things because you have an intelligent dungeon master um, who's there. Um, at this point, I'm going to go into my controversial tabletop theory about why was it that the Dungeons and Dragons appeared when it did. Um, it, it appeared in the early 70s, like what, 1973, I want to say, something yeah. like that, right around there, um, which is kind of crazy. Why did, not, why did this game not appear 10 years earlier, 100 years earlier, 1,000 years earlier. I mean, dice and paper, like we had these things. And my argument is Dungeons and Dragons is actually a spinoff of computer games. In the, around 1970, 1971, college campuses everywhere had these massive computers in them. And people started making these weird little games, these weird little dungeon crawl games. And they were not very good, Hunt the Wumpus and that kind of thing. They weren't very good. and I think we had a whole generation of college students who were like, wait a minute, like this isn't very good, but what if it was? And what if instead of the computer doing this, a human being was doing it? And that's what the dungeon master is. Um, so inspiration kind of comes from like weird ways. Okay, I've gone down so many rabbit holes that I'm lost. <laughs> what were we talking about? Well, I was just, uh, and just on that note, uh, Free Kriegspiel, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Kriegspiel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, and yeah, yeah. So I'm a big fan of Free Kriegspiel, um, which is like the revolution to kind of bring that kind of gaming back, which is like 
the uh, arbiter basically saying, well, this is what the likely outcome would be and, and, and basically the dungeon master, but doing it in a way that's a little bit more of a, I guess, realistic uh, environment. And so there's yeah. like a whole group of people that are trying to get back to that original, like primordial tabletop role-playing version, which is a pre Creekspiel revolution, FKR is uh, yeah. kind of the abbreviation for it. And so it's a fascinating to almost go full, full circle back to those primordial days of tabletop role-playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know the AI thing I was talking about. So the thing that AIs, so yeah. Um, people don't realize the nature of human communication. Um, we have Siri and we have Alexa, but they don't interact like humans at all, right? They interact, you interact with them more like you'd interact with a dog. You, you got to give them commands and they do it or they don't do it. There's no rhythm of conversation. And, um, we're not that far away from having AIs who can actually have a meaningful rhythmic conversation with you. And that's going to create, uh, that's, that's going to be fascinating in a number of realms because the, the, the first thing we'll start to see is games where the NPCs are speaking more intelligently and in a more understanding way. And then I do think we are going to get to the place where we'll start to see virtual game masters who are trying to do the same thing. Um, I think I personally think that's a harder task because NPCs can be so constrained. A shopkeeper only needs to know about shopkeeping things. Uh, a dungeon master needs to know about the entirety of the universe and everyone who's in it. Um, those are those are those are different things, but. The, the AI stuff is coming. It's it's going to sneak up on us. But I, I very much believe we're going to see some meaningful steps in the next five years in that direction. And before we're just about done on our time here, I just wanted to ask you, if you were a young aspiring game designer or an older aspiring game designer, what advice would you pass along to them now? Oh, yeah, the most... the. The, the the most important piece of advice I think is don't don't wait um, don't you just get in there and do it understand that uh, look at what's keeping you from just doing it if you're and usually it's oh I'm afraid what I'm doing isn't any good yeah guess what it's not most of what all of us do isn't any good and so what you have to do is you get out there and you do it and you learn what's not right about it and then you make it a little better and a little better and a little better until eventually you get there but but the only way to get to a good game is to start making bad games there is no way to make good games without making bad games first so that's always my piece of advice please start making bad games now and what is next for Jesse Shell and Jesse Shell Games and future editions of your book uh, yeah, so actually, in terms of the book, I'm presently working on a, a book with uh, Barbara Chamberlain um, uh, called The Art of Educational Game Design, because I've worked on a number of educational games over the years, and there are a lot of special aspects to making games that change people for the better. So uh, uh, Barbara and I are working on that book, so that's that's kind of my, my kind of writing emphasis right now. As for Shell Games, we are very... Uh, uh, focused on VR at the moment. You know, we we never kind of lock into one thing. That's how we've survived for survived and thrived for 20 years. Uh, but at the moment, the, the VR and augmented reality stuff is, is very big for us. So we, we have a lot of focus on that. Among Us VR is a, a current title that's uh, available for sale that we're excited about. And we have a number of other VR and AR titles that are that are in the works right now. So that's where a lot of our focus is kind of seeing how this VR AR revolution goes and doing our best to be a part of it, to make games that, that, that really are going to make the medium be meaningful. Well, I really wanna thank you for joining me today, uh, sharing some of your wisdom and I'll put all that information in the, in the video description and all the links in there. And uh, just wanna say, you know, thank you for the work that you did on the uh, art of game design. It's very inspiring. It's inspired me and I'm sure many other people. So thank you very much for that. All right, thanks so much, Gary. It was great to be here today.